6.1 Song I wish I could go traveling again. I wish I could go traveling again. It feels like this summer will never end. And I've had such good offers from several of my friends. I wish I could go traveling. Again, I wanna sit in my shade, sipping my latte beneath the awning of a famous cafe, jet lagged and with our luggage gone astray. I wish I could go traveling again. I wanna wait at a give us a Understand while we argue about the customs of the land. I wish I could go traveling again. I want to sit in traffic, anxious about our plane. While your blase comments drive me half insane. Shelter with you through the tropical rain. I wish I could go traveling again. I wanna be awakened by a faulty fire alarm in an overpriced hotel devoid of charm, then fall asleep again. Traveling again when I know I'll just keep remembering again when I know. Go traveling again. It feels like this summer will never end. And I've had such good offers from several of my friends. I wish I could go traveling again. Six point two. It's five fifteen. I'm in bed in my house in Woolwich in southeast London, and the alarm has just gone off. Ten minutes later, I've had a shower and I'm trying to eat a bowl of cereal. I'm not that hungry, but I have to eat something. I'll be leaving home very shortly. It's now 5:40, and I'm about to get on my bike to cycle to the tube station. It takes me about half an hour to get to North Greenwich Underground Station. It's now 6:10, and I've just caught a Jubilee Line train, which takes me to Baker Street. The bus to Oxford leaves at 6:40, so I should make it with time to spare. It's due to arrive in Oxford at 8:20, but it depends a bit on the traffic. Oh, I just caught it. 
which was a relief because I need to be on time today. I'm meeting a client at nine o'clock. Ah, on time today, thank goodness. So I've now just got a 10 minute walk and then I'll be there. I desperately need a coffee. Six point three. One. I'll be leaving home very shortly. Two. I'm about to get on my bike to cycle to the tube station. Three. My bus leaves at six forty. Four. It's due to arrive at eight twenty, but it depends a bit on the traffic. Five. I need to be on time today. I'm meeting a client at nine o'clock. 6.4 Part 1 I was in Warsaw in Poland for a week because I had rehearsals and a concert there. But on the Wednesday, Thursday and Friday of that week, I also had to do rehearsals in Berlin. Oh. I needed to be able to have the rehearsal in Warsaw in the morning, then fly to Berlin for the rehearsal there in the late afternoon, and then straight back to Warsaw late at night in time for the next morning rehearsal. Oh. The only way to get to Berlin and back in time was to fly. Mm -hmm. So I hired an air taxi. Oh. As soon as I left the rehearsal, there was a car waiting to take me to the airport. And when I arrived at the airport, my heart sank because the weather was not so good. Oh. And the operations manager said, look, I'm terribly sorry. We can't fly at the moment because of the weather. Finally, the weather cleared and they said we could fly. So I was still hoping to make it in time for my rehearsal. However, we got into the plane and I didn't have a very good impression of it. It looked a bit old. Oh. And there was a little hole where the air was coming oh. through, where the door had been shut on my side. Oh, no. 6.5 Part 2 I thought, well, never mind. And I put on my seat belt, and finally we took off. The weather was not good, and after about five or ten minutes, I was terribly cold. And I thought, well, I know it can be cold, and it was also very noisy. Mm. Normally they give you headphones, but for some reason they didn't. So the noise was very loud, and it got very, very cold. Oh. And then to my horror, I realised that the co-pilot's door wasn't shut properly. <gasps> By this point... The co-pilot himself had realised that the door wasn't shut. So he turned to me and said, Problema! And then he started gesticulating to the pilot, who was already having difficulties because the weather was very bad and it was raining very hard and there was a bit of a storm. <laughs> I was feeling extremely uncomfortable by now, wishing that I was on the ground. But then came the real drama, because the pilot was trying to indicate to the co-pilot how to shut the door properly. Now, what do you do if you're driving a car and you realise that you haven't shut the door properly? You usually stop, mm -hmm. open the door again, and then shut it with a bang, or sometimes you don't even stop. You just, uh, while you're driving slowly, yeah. you do that. Mm. Anyway, this idiotic co-pilot, he proceeded to do precisely that. He then opened the door completely <laughs> in order to shut it properly, and I was just behind them, as this is a small plane, so right in front of me was just open air. Oh. This open door, I was absolutely terrified, cold air rushing in, and then he tried to shut it properly, but presumably because of the pressure or the cold, I don't know what, he couldn't do so. And had he not had his seatbelt on, he would have fallen out of the plane. So he was holding on, partly for dear life, partly to try and shut it unsuccessfully. <laughs> the pilot was shouting at him, but he couldn't correct the situation because, you know, he had to keep the plane in the air, mm. which was now extremely precarious, and the plane was going up and down. 6.6 <sighs> 6. Part 3 then suddenly I felt that we were going right down and I prayed that we were going to land. Oh. To my relief, we landed in one piece, so at least my life was no longer in danger. Mm. But as far as the rehearsal was concerned, I realised with horror that because of this emergency in the air, the pilot had had to land at the nearest town, which was still quite a long way from Berlin. Oh. I had to phone the rehearsal people to say I was going to be late and I was feeling thoroughly miserable. However, we eventually took off and arrived in Berlin and I did my rehearsal. Unfortunately, it had been the type of rehearsal where my lateness had not caused a real problem. Oh. Then on the way back, the pilots were waiting for me at the airport. This was now about 10 o'clock at night or 9.30. 
So this time we took off, and I said, "Are you quite sure the door is properly shut? <laughs> quite sure?"、Mm. And they said, "Yes, yes." And I said, "We're very late now. I want you to get back to Warsaw as fast as possible."、Yeah. And they said, "Yes, the wind is in our favour. This aircraft can go very fast. We should be back soon in Warsaw. Don't worry, everything will go fine."、Mm. So we took off, and things were well. Nothing was going particularly wrong, but I noticed. That they were going rather slowly, but it was still so noisy that I couldn't communicate with them and ask why you're going so slowly.、Mm. Eventually, when we landed, I said, "Why were you going so slowly? I told you to go as fast as possible." And the pilot said, "I'm terribly sorry. I didn't know this plane very well, and we were having a fuel problem, so we're running out of fuel." Oh. So on the way there, I'd nearly fallen to the ground through an open door, and now we'd been in danger of falling to the ground because of lack of fuel. Oh. <laughs> Six point seven. Do you like dogs? No, I don't. But my husband does. So does mine. We have three Alsatians. I went to Iceland last summer. Lucky you! I'd love to go there. Did you see any whales? No, I wanted to, but I get seasick, and you have to go on a boat. Ali doesn't have any pets, does she? She does have a pet. She has a hamster. Oh, I don't like hamsters. <laughs> Neither do I. They're too much like mice. <laughs> Six point eight. And finally, wolves or dogs? Which is more dangerous to mountain walkers? Jean-Luc Renault was on a mountain walking holiday in the French Alps when he saw a blood-stained man staggering towards him. The man's shorts were torn. He had been bitten badly in both buttocks, and he was in a state of complete shock. The man, who was a tourist from Belgium, had been attacked by a notoriously ferocious breed of mountain dog, Le Chien de Montagne de Pyrénées, or the Pyrenean Mountain Dog. This breed is white and fluffy and looks like a cuddly family pet, but it is anything but. Fearless and ferocious, it can weigh up to sixty kilograms and will fight to the death against wolves and bears to save a flock of sheep. So, why are there so many of these dogs around? They've been brought into the French Alps to defend sheep from wolves. Wolves were reintroduced into the Alps in 1992, and there are now about a hundred and fifty of them. They're protected by European Union law, but Alpine farmers say that they've killed thousands of sheep and are a threat to their livelihoods. In an attempt to pacify the farmers, the EU has spent millions of euros on fences and sheep dogs. The plan appeared to be working. The arrival of about a thousand Pyrenean mountain dogs in the Alps coincided with a sharp fall in the number of sheep deaths. But it has also brought about an alarming rise in attacks on holidaymakers by these dogs. The attacks are driving tourists away and are further splitting the community, who were already divided over the reintroduction of the wolf in France. To add to the controversy, several shepherds have been taken to court by holidaymakers who have been attacked, and seventeen dogs have been poisoned in the Morian region of the Alps. Six point nine. And to finish the local news for London today, what's your view on foxes? Are they pests, or should they be a protected species? There are now approximately ten thousand foxes living in London parks, squares, and gardens, and in Hampstead, in North London, their barking is keeping the residents awake at night. Carol Martin is one such sufferer. <laughs> What happened to you last week, Carol? Well, I came down in the morning after another bad night's sleep, and I saw a large fox on my lawn, which didn't look very well at all. It had bits of fur hanging off it. I was worried that it might have some infectious disease, so I phoned the local council. And what did they say? Well, first I asked for pest control, and they said what pest, and I said a fox. But the woman from the council told me that foxes aren't pests, and she put me through to the fox project department. The Fox Project Department. So then, what happened? 
Well, the man from the Fox Project asked me to find out if the fox was really ill, and he said that once they knew what was wrong with it, they could supply me with some medicine. So I said that first of all, I didn't speak fox language, <laughs> and secondly, I had no intention of going anywhere near it. I said that I would like the fox dead, and the only medicine I was interested in was poison. I see. And how did they respond to that? Well, the Fox Project man got a bit annoyed and told me that this was not a caring attitude at all, and he suggested that it might be best to send an ambulance to take the animal to a vet, or if it wasn't seriously ill, to take it to the country and release it back into the wild. That's what the man from the council suggested. Those were his very words. At this point, I couldn't believe what I was hearing. Luckily, when I looked out of the window again, the fox had disappeared. So I hung up. It does seem absolutely ridiculous to me. Camden Council have problems getting ambulances to sick people because of staff shortages, but they are able to provide ambulances to take sick foxes to the vet. Well, thank you, Carol. <laughs> Incredible. So, does anyone else have a story about foxes in London? Do give us a ring. Six point ten, one. Now this is something I feel very strongly about. Two. Well, I don't feel particularly strongly about it either way.、I'm、Three. I have to say I'm completely against zoos nowadays. Four. Oh no, I totally disagree with you there. Five. Well, I couldn't disagree with you well, more. Six. Well, I, I don't entirely agree with you. Seven. Well, I'm absolutely <laughs> convinced that the animal does not want to be there. Eight. Well, I'm quite sure that kids could get the same amount of pleasure from seeing animals in the wild. Six point eleven. Renata. Why did you decide to come to Spain? Well. It's a bit complicated. It was a bit of a fluke, really. In fact, it was my husband who first came up with the idea of moving here. He's from Peru, and when I met him, he was studying catering in Poland, in Poznan, where I live. And he could sort of speak a bit of Polish, but not very well. So it would have been very difficult for him to get a job in Poland. Not to mention the paperwork, which would have been very complicated too. At that time, when we got married, I mean. I just finished university, where I'd studied Spanish, and I'd got a job teaching Spanish in a school. So we thought about what we were going to do, because if we'd stayed in Poland, I would have to be the one that worked. So as I spoke Spanish, and of course he did too, we decided to try living in Spain. When was this? About four years ago. We came with nothing, with just a bit of money and two suitcases, and that was it. But bit by bit. We managed to find jobs and somewhere to live. We were very lucky. The guy who rented us our first flat was a chef, and he gave my husband a job. And I managed to get a job teaching Spanish to Polish immigrants here.、Hmm. What's the plus side for you about living in Spain? What I like best is that if you're prepared to work hard, you can get what you want. You can get a good standard of living quite easily. Then the weather is nice. It's not as cold as in Poland, though. Actually, I really miss the snow. Here in Valencia, it never snows. Another good thing here is that you have the sea and mountains quite close by, which we didn't have in Poznan. What about the downside? The traffic. I absolutely hate driving here. Nobody obeys the traffic rules. They drive really crazily. And、um, what else? The food is different, but it's okay. My husband would say the noise. The people here are so noisy. In Peru, people aren't nearly as noisy. They live in their houses. If you want to see someone, you go to their house. They're not in the street all the time like they are here. I agree with him, and I think people gossip a lot here too. They're always talking about what everyone else is doing, and I don't like that.、Hmm. There must be things you miss about Poland. Of course, lots of things. The food, my family and my friends, the little corners of my town that I love, my favorite cafes and cinemas—that's what I miss most. Might you go back to Poland one day? I personally would love to go back, but I'm not sure if we ever will. 
it would be very difficult, especially for my husband. But you never know, or maybe we'll end up in Peru. 6.12 Andrew I've been living in Milan for just over 15 years now. The reason why I first came here was because I'd always wanted to go and live abroad. I'd always had this picture in my mind of me having aperitifs at a cafe on some exotic seafront promenade in the south of France, or somewhere like that. Although, I must admit, I never imagined staying abroad for so long. Even when I married my Italian girlfriend, I always thought we'd eventually go back to the UK. You see, what I like best about living here is that in some way I'm still living the dream. Even though I have a demanding job with a multinational company and a young child, both of which have their own stresses, somewhere in my brain there's a little voice that reminds me that I'm living abroad as I always wanted to be. Something which I think is very true is what another Brit said to me some time ago. He said, despite everything, it's almost as if you were still on holiday. And although Milan isn't half as exotic as people might imagine, I mean, it's a bit grey and industrial, it's a bit like Manchester in that way, the food is a million times better, and you're only 40 kilometres of motorway away from the Alps, and about 130 from the Mediterranean. The problems I have here are mainly to do with the bureaucracy, which can be incredibly frustrating. For instance, the other day, the doctor told me I needed a chest x-ray, and just to book the appointment involved me queuing in two different places for an hour and a half. The practicalities of life can be frustrating too. Socially, Italy has changed enormously in the last 15 years, but the state hasn't realised it yet. Most Italian women work these days, but nursery schools are still only open from 8.30 in the morning till about 4 in the afternoon. So who goes to pick your child up when both parents work full-time? The things I miss most about the UK are the countryside and the BBC. I find the Italian news too politically biased. But I can't really see myself going back. I'm a foreigner here, but I think I'm also a foreigner in the UK now too. When I go back to the UK, and that's maybe twice a year, and watch the TV, I understand the language, but the words or constructions are not what I would say. It isn't just language, though. It's the way of life. The UK has changed a lot, and I can't say that I like it. It seems a much more violent place than it used to be, and it seems too... well, it's too politically correct. For example, on the news, I notice they never say actress now for women because it's supposed to be sexist. They say actor for both men and women. I think it's all getting a bit out of hand. Italy still hasn't gone too far down that road, thank goodness. 6.13 1. In fact, it was my husband who first came up with the idea of moving here. Two. What I like best is that if you're prepared to work hard, you can get what you want. 3. The reason why I first came here was because I'd always wanted to go and live abroad. 4. The things I miss most about the UK are the countryside and the BBC. 6.14 1. What I hate about my job is having to get up early. 2. The reason why I went to France was because I wanted to learn the language. 3. It was her mother who really broke up our marriage. 4. It's the commuting that I find so tiring. 6.15 1. What I don't understand is why she didn't call me. 2. The thing that impresses me most about Jack is his enthusiasm. 3. The reason why I left early was because I had an important meeting. 4. The place where I would most like to live is Ireland. 5. It was the neighbours that made our lives so difficult. 6. It was then that I realised I'd left my keys behind. 
6.16 Part 1 What made you decide to become a vet? I was always interested in animals and originally when I was at school I was hoping to become a zoologist. I wanted to study animals and their behaviour. And because my father was working at a university at the time, I said to him, um, do you know anybody there that I can go and talk to in the zoology department? And he said, arrange for me to meet the professor of zoology. And I went to the university and he said to me, do you want to teach? And I said, no, I don't think I do. He said, well, 80% of the people who do the zoology course teach. Have you ever thought of being a vet? Oh, I thought that's a rather good idea. Do you prefer treating farm animals or pets? Personally, I'm, I do probably a little bit more with the farm work, but I don't mind. I like treating them all. I like being involved in them all. And I'm in general practice, so I don't have a specialisation in one particular species or one particular discipline within that. So why do you tend to prefer farm animals? I quite like meeting the people and the farm. I'm living in the countryside where we are today in this surgery. We're right in a little village in the countryside on the border of England and Wales. And if you look around and look out there, you'd understand why it's nice to be able to go around and drive around a bit of that country, see the animals there. What's the most difficult animal to treat? It's surprising what people turn up with in the surgery. So sometimes most of the animals that we would see are, belong to a certain groups there, dogs, cats, maybe rabbits, guinea pigs, uh, hamsters, ferrets. But now we're starting to see camelids, that is llamas, um, certainly we've got llamas locally and other members of that same group. Those suddenly present a challenge because you're looking at an animal that you haven't really dealt with and is different because every species is different. Even within a species we sometimes variations between breeds. So the most difficult is really just one that you're not used to and you suddenly find yourself thinking, what are the peculiarities? Uh, what's the anatomy? What's the anatomical variation? How will, how will particular medicines react? What is the dosage? And you sincerely hope that either you've got a book or there's something somewhere or somebody you can ring up and find out. But I can assure you that when somebody brought a tarantula spider in one day, I did have a moment there where I thought to myself, now what are we going to do with that? It's the dreaded cardboard box. Somebody comes in with a little cardboard box and they put it down very proudly on the table and you're waiting in expectation and they say, then they open it up and you look at it and go, ah, very interesting. Now, um, what is that? What do you think is the most intelligent animal of all the ones you treat? I suppose when we're dealing with intelligence, it's a question you can have intelligent animals within a particular species. So I've met some extremely intelligent dogs, particularly collies, working collies. They are amazing at how they get the sheep in, how they sort them out or work with the cattle. Marvellous. Um, people always say pigs are very intelligent. And I had a professor at college who always maintained that why do we keep dogs and cats? We should keep pigs as pets. He reckoned they were very clean and they were wonderful animals to have as a pet, highly intelligent. What's the best and worst thing about your job? I think the best is always birth. It doesn't matter what species, birth is brilliant, amazing. Every time it happens, one marvels at it, whatever the species. Uh, I suppose the worst is always having to put an animal down, put it to sleep. 6.17 Part 2 How do you feel about animals being used in experiments? Well, the whole principle of using animals in experiments has been reviewed, certainly in this country, very, very strongly. And it, the principle has been to try to reduce the number of animals used. Now, unfortunately, there seems to be no other way of achieving always the, the result that we require in, in testing an, uh, a particular substance. I do find myself a little bit uncomfortable with the wish that there is to test substances other than medicine. But when we start to get testing cosmetics and things that are uh, somewhat ephemeral in the needs of the human population, I'm not sure that's a good use of animals. 
How do you feel about people having large, dangerous dogs as pets? All dogs can be dangerous. If you look at where deaths have occurred in babies and small children, it's surprising. Sometimes it's been very small dogs that have been involved. It hasn't always been the big dogs. Unfortunately, it's not really the dog's problem and fault. It's usually the owner's problem and fault. And so if the owner can't restrain, keep control, have a proper care of that animal, then any dog can become more dangerous. And the principle of leaving children with dogs is one that should not on any occasion occur, no matter how good uh, anybody believes a particular dog is. Dogs can be dangerous. Are there any animals or insects you're afraid of? I suppose that afraid is one word, being extremely cautious of is another. I've been attacked by cows, uh, not uncommonly, unfortunately, over the years, picked up and thrown across the room, uh, and so on. And now you, everybody thinks cows are rather nice creatures and so on, but when they've got a calf at foot, they are very protective and they can be extremely dangerous. A sow with its piglets will be very dangerous and possibly one of the most dangerous species that we deal with. I've uh, treated tigers, I've treated uh, chimpanzees and in their own rights those are extremely dangerous. So I think it's a question of assessing the animal, the risk and taking the suitable precautions because sometimes it's the small ones that bite you when you're not thinking about it, rather than the big one that you are watching and thinking was going to be dangerous. Do you have any pets yourself? Yes, over the years we've had various animals. Uh, at the moment we've got a dog, uh, 40 sheep, a couple of ponies and a snake. Uh, it sits in its, uh, in its vivarium on the, on the landing at home and it's my son's snake and I think he uses it purposely to um, terrify uh, some of the young ladies who visit uh, and others and that uh, my daughter's boyfriend is not at all keen on it and will walks around the landing to try and avoid it. Has it ever escaped? Uh, on one occasion it did escape uh, briefly but was rapidly recaptured, I hasten to add. Would you recommend becoming a vet? Yes, I think that uh, it's been a good life. I certainly have enjoyed it. Uh, it's meant it's very challenging, very demanding. You never stop learning. And in fact, you can't stop learning because medicine, whether it be veterinary medicine or human medicine, the changes are immense over the years. So you're constantly having to be kept up to date by reading, attending lectures, uh, talking to colleagues, and also by your clients. Because these days with the internet, they very often will come in with a whole sheaf of papers and say, we think our dog has got so-and-so. Here you are, Mr. Vet, look at all this information. And you then sort of go, thank you very much, and put it gently to one side and have a look at the animal and decide that this extraordinary disease that they've just found on the internet doesn't have any relation to what's in front of you. But uh, that's one of the challenges of today. 6.18 one. It's surprising what people turn up with in the surgery. Two. But I can assure you that when somebody brought a tarantula spider in one day. Three. I suppose the worst is always having to put an animal down, put it to sleep. Four. And the principle of leaving children with dogs is one that should not on any occasion occur, no matter how good uh, anybody believes a particular dog is. Five. So you're constantly having to be kept up to date by reading, attending lectures. Six. We think our dog has got so and so. 6.19 1. Pretty. Are there any animals or insects that you're afraid of or feel uncomfortable with? Mosquitoes. Just, they bite me a lot um, and I'm really, really allergic to their bites. Um, Have you ever had a frightening experience involving an animal? Um, there was one time in India on a, a tiger safari and we were in, in an open 4x4 four four going down this steep hill when we came across a tiger uh, in the middle of the path coming up towards us so we had to try and reverse up uh, whilst this tiger was stalking towards us so that was, that was pretty scary. 2. Sheila 
Are there any animals or insects that you are afraid of or feel uncomfortable with? Snakes. hate them. Have you always felt like this? Yes. <laughs> I think so. Um, I've seen a few snakes in the wild and really don't like them. I have, I have had a boa constrictor put around my neck, um, but I didn't like it very much. <laughs> have you ever had a frightening experience involving an animal? <laughs> a few. Um, the elephant was probably the most frightening. Um, I was on safari with my husband and we were having lunch in the camp and he said, oh, I'm just going to pop up to the, the, the office. There's a little office in a hut um, because they can charge your batteries at certain times of the day. So he said, I'll just pop up and get my battery for the camera. Um, and he, he, off he went. Five minutes later, he came running back into the, into the lunch area and said, oh, there's an elephant out there. Come on, come and have a look. And so the guy in the restaurant said, just be careful, don't get too close. But he didn't say what he meant by don't get too close. So out we went and we walked around the corner and we looked up the pathway and there was a massive elephant and it saw us and it just came charging towards us. Thank God behind us the waiter had come out and we were just about to turn and run because the elephant was very, very close, probably about 10, 15 feet away. We were just about to run and the waiter said, whatever you do, don't run. So we just stood our ground and the elephant swung its trunk a bit and then walked away. But my heart was beating so fast. It was really quite frightening. Three. Jerry. Are there any animals or insects that you're afraid of or feel uncomfortable with? Um, I'm, I'm afraid of spiders, I must confess. I mean, above a certain size, I'm, I'm afraid of them. The small ones I can cope with, larger ones I don't like very much. Even, even pictures of spiders in a book you know, or a magazine, if I turn a page and see a picture of a spider, I can, a little shudder of uh, fear passes through me. Have you always felt like this? Yeah, yeah. I mean, it's getting better. <laughs> but when I was a child, it was really quite bad. You know, I'd run screaming from the room. I don't do that anymore. Have you ever had a frightening experience involving an animal? I've had a, 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 an encounter with a bear in, in a national park in California where I was having uh, camping with a friend and we were eating dinner around a campfire and he looked over my shoulder and said, Jerry, there's a bear behind you and it was standing up on its hind legs uh, about 10 feet away. So we had to withdraw and they set our dinner and then walked off. So it was, no, there was no damage done, but it was quite frightening. 6.20 1. When we came across a tiger uh, in the middle of the path, coming up towards us. 2. So he said, I'll just pop up and get my battery for the camera. 3. And he, he, off he went. 4. So the guy in the restaurant said, just be careful, don't get too close. 5. So it was, no, there was no damage done, but it was quite frightening.